A strong grip commands respect in the bar room or the boardroom. It also shows a future father-in-law what's gonna be the new pecking order. So we came to the number one grip expert in the world, Joe Musselwhite, and he's gonna share some tips with us today. Joe, we're here with Joe Musselwhite today. Uh, tell, tell everybody watching a little bit about yourself. Sure, my name's Joe Musselwhite. I'm also known in the, on the internet as Mighty Joe. I've had that nickname since 2008 when I joined the grip board. Uh, I'm 54 years old, I'll be 55 in September. I uh, live in Trinidad, Texas, and basically, in a nutshell, I'm obsessed with grip. I love everything about grip, all aspects of grip. I train grip, I test grip, I research grip, and uh, I'm also a collector. And September 1st of 2014, I established the world record for the world's largest private collection of hand grippers and grip implements. And I have a wife, three kids, and they're all grown up. And it's me, my wife, and my grip museum. <laughs> cool. So, Joe, uh, there's a lot of different types of grip strength because I mean, you could be trying to hold on to a deadlift, you could be trying to pinch grip plates or whatever. So, why don't you tell us what the different types of grip strength are and maybe like some examples for someone who's familiar with it? Sure. The, there's three main types of grip strength that most every strength athlete is familiar with, and that would be like crushing strength, like closing your fist, closing a hand gripper, like these torsion spring grippers. Uh, there's a pinch where you pinch between your fingertips and your thumb. And there's also a supporting type grip, like where you're holding a barbell in a deadlift or a suitcase lift, that's a supporting type grip. Now, there's other types of grip outside of them that or it's probably worth mentioning because it's, it's interesting about how grip has evolved from back in 1956 when Dr. John Napier classified grip into two parts. It was power grip and precision grip. And all other aspects or types of grip fall under precision or power grip. So, for instance, you have what they call, if you used to grab a ball or a sphere, it's called like a claw grip or a spherical grip. Another example would be a hub. That would be a claw grip like this. It emphasizes the fingertip strength. Uh, this type of grip here is called an oblique grip. It's, it falls under power grip. And let me tell you the difference, what distinguishes a power grip from a precision grip. It has to do with the palm. If, if anything touches the palm, it's a power grip. If it's just your thumb and your fingertips and nothing touching the palm, it's a precision grip. And then there's, uh, like I said, there's the pinch, like if you're pinching blocks or plates, uh, scale weights, there's all kinds of implements you can pinch. Uh, if you was to grab the implement like this, cause see the palm is touching, that would be a power grip. If it's just your thumb and your fingertips, it would be a precision pinch. So you have a, a power pinch, a precision pinch, okay? And then there's, uh, let's see, uh, the least used type of grip strength would be what they call scissor grip. It's like this. And uh, an example that's unrelated to fitness or strength would be like someone holding a cigarette in their fingers like this. So really, I don't put too much emphasis on that because it's the least amount used or the so least. So say what it is, it can go, go back to. Well, if you uh, abduct and adduct your fingers, yeah. they call this scissor grip like this. And it's the least one used, but the muscles in your hand, the intrinsic muscles inside, they come into play big time when you're like doing any type of power grip. Yeah and they help stabilize your grip. These, they call them interosseous muscles and the lumbricals. And when you do any type of power grip, they kick in and help stabilize the grip. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of people think these muscles in, on the back and front side of your palm are not important, but they're very, very important. Um, so keep that cigarette in there, it's like that king of the hill you're smoking yeah. like a Frenchman. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Uh, 
There's also a crimp grip. This is pretty important because rock climbers, this is a crimp grip like this or like this, okay? It's where the fingers are flexed at, the, at this joint here. It's called the MCP joint. And rock climbers, that's the sole grip they use is like this. Arm wrestlers, competitive arm wrestlers, also use a crimp grip to create what they call finger pressure when they're setting up at the table to arm wrestle. And when they hook up hands, they're in this type of grip, a crimp grip, and some people call it monkey grip because that's how monkeys grip stuff. Uh, that's another important type of grip strength. Uh, the oblique grip, the claw grip, the oblique grip, like if you used to take an anvil and lift it by the horn like this. This is an oblique grip. They call it oblique because of the hand position and the way the fibers in your thumb run, they're oblique. But this particular implement here would, would simulate like a anvil horn lift and you would put a carabiner on it, attach it to a loading pin and then put weights on it and you would lift it. So that's an oblique grip. And that pretty much covers all of the grip, the types of grip strength. And uh, they all have their place. They're all important, relatively speaking, depending on what you're doing. But uh, there's basically seven types and they all fall, fall under either power grip or precision grip. So you can divide each type of grip, it sounds like, into like a dynamic and a static component? Absolutely, there is a dynamic component and there's a static component. If you take this torsion spring gripper right here and you start doing reps, that's the dynamic component of grip, which this is the crush grip. If you take this same gripper and you just hold it shut and just do a negative or a, a static hold, that's the static component. If you take a pinch block or an implement and lift up, you got weight hooked to this and you lock it out, if you just stand there and hold it for time, that's a static component of grip. Okay. So explain how you feel uh, or how each of these type, type of grips important like in real life and in sport. Well, in real life, uh, a strong grip can actually save your life. For example, if you and your family's out and about and you're out on the town, you went out to eat, you stop to get gas, you know, like the gas station ready. You, you stop go. to get gas and you run into an altercation. Your grip strength could literally be the difference in life and death. Let's say uh, the guy, the, the criminal pulled out a knife and he was fixing to stab you or your family members and you grab his wrist to stop him from stabbing you or cutting you. Being able to hang on to his wrist to make sure he doesn't cut you, that, that, that's the best example I can give real life. I mean, that's real as it gets. Well, I remember in high school playing football, one advantage I'd have some getting in there to get in a sack or something, and someone's getting away from me. One thing I could always do is, if, you know, you're getting away from me, I got you by the jersey, you ain't gonna go anywhere. Once I got you, sure. you're not getting away. That's right. And that's, you know, something you don't even think about. Like, so, yeah. Yeah, and in a sport, like a, that, that's a real world example. Now, a sport example, you just mentioned a good one. Another good one is martial arts. In judo, in uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, the grip is important specifically if they're doing the gi type of grappling. I mean, that grip is, is everything. And you know, I brought this bag, being we're on the subject, and what this is, it's a coin bag from a bank. It's very heavy, and you can put anything you want in it. You can put change or whatever, but something I do with some of my clients, I train their grip. Yeah. Like if they're in mixed martial arts and that where you grab that gi or their clothing or whatever, this put weights, chains or anything in here, rocks, it doesn't matter. But grabbing this thing like this and holding it or swinging it is a great way to develop that type of claw grip strength. And you know, it simulates clothing or a gi. Have you ever done pull-ups with a gi? Uh, no, not with a gi, but yeah. that, that's a good idea. Yeah, but it's very yeah. good. Now I've done pull-ups with a, like a, a towel, a beach towel. Yeah, exactly. Roll it up, throw it over a power rack and start doing pull-ups or holds. You can do holds. I'm a big fan of holds. Uh, it's easier on the joints. Uh, you know, you, as you well know, when you like isometrically contract a muscle, 
you can output more force than you can sure. dynamically. So I'm a big fan of holds as far as strength, gaining right. strength. And if you can't hold your body weight up, like do these pull-ups he's talking about, you could just put some bands under you or something to offset a little bit of the load Absolutely. And, and work your way up. That's it. That's it. Uh, let's see. That's uh, uh, in training. Another good example that we have a real world. We went over a sport specific. Another one is like in your training, for example, deadlifts. If your supporting type grip is not strong enough, you're either A, not going to be able to complete the workout, B, you're going to drop a bunch of lifts. Your, one of your hands is going to slip. So in, in that scenario, it, grip strength, here, here's why everyone Eventually should, you're going to get strong enough to have a grip problem. That's it. And the thing is, most people don't take care of it because they're, you know, oh yeah, I got 600, no problem, 700, and they get to 800, and that could be the one thing to hold them back. So you might as well train it early. And That's it. Not and, and don't worry about failing. Don't, yeah. I mean, you don't go there. You strengthen it ahead of time. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, like uh, on the deadlift, another thing uh, is, if you ever noticed in a powerlifting meet, they'll do the opposite grip. Yeah. They'll do an over and an under. Well. This is just like history information about the deadlift and why people take the supinated pronated grip. When they made wood screws, they designed them threads based on the fact that you, your supinators are stronger than your pronators. When you pronate like this or supinate when your palm's up, if you'll notice elite power lifters, their weakest hand is always supinated. The other one is pronated, and the reason why is because if you grab the bar with the palm facing forward in the deadlift, the weaker hand, it's going to be stronger because of the supinator. Sure. And the bicep uh, brachii. So the pronated, the strongest hand, it'll be pronated because it's going to be stronger, less likely to slip. So that's why the threads are right hand like round on wood screws because they take advantage of that fact that supination is stronger than pronation. Mm -hmm. That's if you're a right-handed person. So that's just an interesting little tidbit about, you know, pronation and supination and holding that bar. A lot of people don't know why they hold the bar that way. They just grab it that way because they've been taught that way. But that's why. It's because your supinators are stronger than the pronator. Interesting. So. Yeah, speaking of deadlift too, that's kind of like I like to do strengthen right here. I learned this from Ed Cohn. You're always going to slip right here, too. So really strengthen this part right here. That's right. Yeah, yeah the rain pinky. That's mm -hmm. right. So yeah. anyways, um, so you got a bunch of cool implements here. Sure. All, very good. But let's just say you're training a commercial gym and you're not, you're not like you said you love everything about grip and you're just a regular guy that wants to get some power off or whatever. You're not like all about grip. You're right. all about something else. But you like to add to this. Is this possible to train this stuff? Absolutely. Without specialized implements in a commercial sure. gym? Sure. When I walked in here... I had a few minutes to look around, and one thing I noticed, every gym mm -hmm. has dumbbells. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. Every gym. I've never seen a gym without dumbbells. <laughs> you can take advantage of that fact. Let's say you wanted to incorporate some grip training into your normal training, whether yeah. you're a bodybuilder, power builder, makes no difference. A dumbbell can, you can do, grab a dumbbell in each hand, Yep. do farmer's holds where you just hold dumbbell in each hand. Yep. You could do farmer's walks for distance, do timed holds. And then as a progression, you could take a hand towel that nearly everybody carries in their bags, just carry an extra one, wrap them around that handle. This is assuming there's nothing in the gym that's grip related, not even fat grips. So even if you don't have these, you could take hand towels. How much do fat grips cost this people about? Under 20 bucks. Under 20 bucks right there. Right so there. You would have to, like 50 years ago, buy a specialized set of dumbbells or barbells that are fat grips and run thousands. That's it. This is 20 bucks. can and change everything. That's right. And fat grips come in like two or three different diameters. These are like two and a half inch. They have two inch and they have three inch. They call them extremes. But uh, these have really, really helped the grip community as far as a easy, cheap way to enhance your grip strength is just throw these on your barbell or a dumbbell. But let's just say you didn't have them. You go to a gym, they don't have them, or nobody has them. Putting towels around the dumbbell handles is actually more challenging because it tries to slip, and it increases the diameter of that handle. 
So that's a good way for the supporting and the crush. Now, if you go over to the weight rack, you start looking at the plates. You can take weight plates for your pinching part, pinching strength. And if you're a beginner, just take a couple of 10 pound plates, put the smooth sides out and practice pinching the plates. Grab the plates. Let's say these are the plates and you pinch them and you lock it out and do holds or you can do farmer's carries. I'm a huge fan of farmer's carries on anything grip related and here's why. Because if you had two of anything, if you had two amble horn trainers, you can do farmer's holds or walks with them. If you have two balls, same thing. Where'd you get that ball, Elite FTS? Or okay, this ball here comes from Sornax, Richard okay. Sorn. They make some of the best strength equipment on the planet. And speaking of Sornax, Richard Sorn is the man that got me started in grip. Okay. He's the first person to certify on the Captain's of Crush number three gripper in 1991. Okay. Okay, it just so happens that's when me and him met. And that's when I officially got started in grip is he sent me a bunch of old school articles, old time strongman, and they was all grip related and I instantly become hooked. And now here I am. I mean, got the world's largest collection of hand grippers, grip implements. And what initially started my interest in grip is I was a competitive arm wrestler from 1979 to 1994. And I found out very quick that hand strength was very important in arm wrestling on a competitive mm -hmm. level. Far more important than like big biceps and upper arm, big right. chest. That, that wasn't where the emphasis was. It was on hand strength, your, your grip. And I went about it wrong because I didn't know. You know, everybody learns. And that's what started my interest in these torsion spring hand grippers right here. And I bought some thinking, well, this type of strength, closing these grippers, a translate to the table, there'll be a carryover. I was wrong. But this is what, that's what initially got me just hooked on hand grippers. And then I started collecting them over the years and now 25 So you could be really good at that, but if you never practice any kind of supporting, it doesn't mean you can hold an 800 pound deadlift. And close um, a four for reps and then that's it. not be able to do a 500 pound hold. That's it, and I'm glad you brought that up. Here's something very important. Don't get me wrong, I love hand grippers. Hand grippers have their place, they have their function. But there's very little carryover when you get stronger at these hand grippers, specifically torsion spring. Now I'm gonna talk about another gripper that's not the case, but with these type of grippers, the carryover to other aspects of grip is not that great. But it does, if, if you wanna get strong in hand grippers, you do hand grippers, it's that simple. If you wanna get strong pinch supporting grip, you don't go this route. That that's not the way to go. But if you want to get good at hand grippers, you got to practice these hand grippers, these specific types. So that that's something to, important to remember. So okay, and then uh, you were mentioning before something about the hex dumbbell plates you could use for gripping. I remember sure another time we talked. Yes, uh, if like the claw grip I was talking about, this type of grip, or like a hub lift which just simulates like the center of a 45 pound plate. You can go to the rack at a commercial gym, grab a hex head dumbbell by the end, you grab one end. Well, now you're working your pinch, and if your palm's not touching, you can work the precision, you can butt it up to your palm, work the power pinch, you can put one in each hand, walk for distance, do timed holds, and the way to progress is either walk further, hold them longer, or get bigger dumbbells. Okay. And that is a great way to strengthen your pinch grip at a commercial gym without buying any grip equipment. Now what if, okay, let's just say the flip side now, what if you're gonna go all in on grip, you're like, I wanna do this, I wanna compete, be the best I can be. What would, what kind of implements would you need to get, kind of get started to really be, you know, right. competitive? Okay. okay, there's two things to consider with that question. One would be, how much money do you have? Let's say not a whole lot. Okay, not a whole lot. Okay, you would focus, in my opinion, based on my experience, I no longer compete. I, I just, I don't compete. But I have a great interest in the contest. I have a huge interest in holding grip challenges, which we can discuss later. But uh, if you want to go all in, let's say you're going to start doing grip contests. You would want a pinch implement, for sure. 
and that can be like a, a Euro device, which is two steel plates. They're about they're a little bit smaller than 45s in diameter. And in between, they have rubber discs in between them. And it allows you to adjust the thickness of this thing. And in a nutshell, there's a bar that goes through it to load plates. You pinch this thing, stand up, and that's one of the events. It's matter of fact, it's a very popular event. It's called the Euro Pinch. There's two hand, there's, there's single hand. But I would say the centerpiece of anybody getting in grip, the centerpiece implement or equipment would be an axle of at least two inches in diameter. And here, here's the good thing. I've been looking around gyms that I go in, and I notice a lot of gyms are starting to carry axles now, and that's a good thing. That tells me grip, the importance of grip strength is getting out there. Well, and if you don't have, like, so you're not, like, super competitive, or you can get the fat grips again for 20 bucks. So. Yeah, fat grips is a great alternative. Uh, and then, like on your, I mean, you pretty much said it. I mean, you could get the fat grips, Preferably get an axle if you're going to compete because what's the old saying? You train how you play. Yeah. Okay. When let's say you're going to there's going to be a, a axle deadlift contested at the grip contest. Yes, you could train with these. Yes, there would be carry over to an axle, but optimally, because of the said principle, you would want to specifically train on an axle. That's specific adaptations to impose demand. That's that's correct. If you don't know. Thank that. you. Yes. Okay, and then same way for the pinch. Whatever apparatus they're going to use, preferably get that implement, yeah. train it specifically. A lot of grip contests, they have grippers contested, and they're rated, different ratings. And if you're going to go to a contest that has grippers, you would need to buy some grippers. And the reason I brought these grippers specifically is if you'll notice... Nick, you zoom in on this or whatever, there's set screws on these, these handles. And what this does, these are adjustable. It allows you to move these handles up and down this torsion spring. When you, when you bring them down further, there's more leverage, this gripper becomes easier, okay? When you move them up, it becomes harder. It's been my experience from rating grippers with a digital dyno that for every sixteenth of an inch that you move this handle up or down, you gain one to three pounds, just depending on the spring and the spread. So if you bought several of these grippers, that would be equivalent to buying basically 20 or 30 grippers. So if, if you're gonna if train for grippers, I strongly recommend this, this type of gripper by Silvus. I have a, a complete set of them, it's the way to go and you're specifically training hand grippers. So you wouldn't have to buy 100 grippers at different ratings to train the grippers. Yeah. So this is a great way to go. Okay. So, uh, and then it, one, one event, one feat that I haven't talked about is a V-bar lift. V-bar means vertical bar. And what it is, it's a two foot piece of either one inch or two inch diameter steel. It's two foot long. And what it is, there's a stop welded on the bottom. This is just a one inch loading pin, but I'm gonna use this for demonstration purposes. Okay, you load plates on it. Remember initially at the beginning of the video, I was talking about this oblique grip like yeah. this? Okay, V-bar lifts, vertical bars, is a vertical lift it's on the floor and you stand up over it and you grab it with your thumb pointing down you squeeze it and you lift it up off the well, ground like, show us on that like it would be like this if this was the v-bar you and the plates are on it you grab it like this and you'd stand up with it like that and there is guys now getting well over 300 pounds on that lift wow now this brings me to something very interesting that i've known for years I don't think I've ever shared it in writing or on the internet, but it's worth mentioning here. There was a doctor by the name of Charles Long in 1970, and him and his colleagues, he was an orthopedic surgeon, and this was at uh, Case Western University in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. And they did mapping of the entire forearm and hand muscles, every one of them, all of them. The, the flexors, the extensors, all the intrinsic muscles of the hand. They did EMG, electromyocardiogram, yeah. they, where they test the electrical output of all these muscles. 
Well, it just so happens, guess what two types of grip elicited the greatest response on the MG? It was the oblique grip, and it was the ball grip, like a sphere, they called it spherical grip. The EMG went berserk. So that, that tells you something. It tells you a lot about grip strength. You want to train the oblique grip. And like I said earlier, if you take this bag and you put chains in it, I put 40 pounds of chains in each one, and I go for a walk. But look, if you're holding it like this down by your side, that's that oblique squeeze grip, that power grip. That's eliciting just, yeah. it's working every aspect of your grip, including these interosseous muscles in between each phalan each uh, metacarpal. Hugely important. That's one of the few times they're ever active. So, and in your form, all of them come alive, all of them. So if you train balls, like this is a three inch, they have four inch. When you load something on here, or you can even hook this to a uh, lap pull down machine. If you had that's, two of them. That's a good point. So if you were gonna do this kind of stuff, and you like, so say you're working your shoulders and you don't want to invest a ton of time in grip, just, you know, do some, get a little extra work, get a little lateral raise or something. There you the go, angle. there you go. So that, that you could, I mean, this wouldn't be like if you're gonna be world champion in grip, you just wanna do a little extra. Like he said, lap pull downs, whatever, you know, obviously you don't want grip to be the limiting factor. However, you're trying to get a little extra work in and not, you know, blast your lats or shoulders to oblivion. That's There's it. kind of a good alternative where you can also train your grip and, kill two birds with one stone. And that brings me back to the towel. I am a huge fan of the towel. Toss a beach towel in your gym bag. It's the cheapest alternative. You can go to any gym. It wouldn't take much at all to figure out how to attach it to uh, like a, a cable machine where you do seated rows. Uh -huh. You put that towel on there like this and you start doing them yeah. rows. There's that oblique grip. Every muscle in your hands and forearms are getting fired up. I'm telling you, you can get a ferocious grip by training the oblique grip. It covers it all. See so kettlebell swings with a towel? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. that's a good one. That would be a good one. Uh, but uh, these right here, these are called, these are, they're just sections of pipe made by Sornex. And I use these a lot. People do pull-ups with them. And it, again, it's doing, the, it's working that oblique grip. Yeah. And you can do farmer's carries or holds with them. Uh, those are getting more popular. I saw the, I went over the Rangers, Texas Rangers, and I saw a bunch of those. Really? Well, that's good to hear. In their weight room. Yeah, that's yeah. good to hear. Uh, and another thing I like doing is hooking any of this stuff with just a little imagination. You can use resistance bands to create a whole different dynamic that, you know, simulates how muscle tissue actually works. It has that elast elastic component. Well, when you hook bands to this stuff, it's the same thing. It's actually real good. It's, it's safer on the joints. And you can get a very, very strong grip. Very strong. You, I, I remember you were talking, um, I went to one of Joe's seminars and um, it was at Metroflex in Arlington. And, yep. and he, I remember you mentioning you felt in grip training a lot of what was lacking was strengthening of the wrists. Big time, big time. And here's the thing. Anytime your grip strength increases, in the hands. Think about when it increases in this, your wrist stability stays the same. These bones are susceptible to getting injured, uh, actually even broke. There's people who have broke their scaphoid bone by doing sledgeham le sledgehammer levers like this, where you're going back like this, and they break that bone. It's the most common wrist bone broke. But, but here's the thing. You need to work your wrist in proportion to your grip strength. As your grip strength increases, you should do things to increase your wrist strength, like wrist curls, both normal and, and reverse, uh, levering. And then radial ulnar deviation. Absolutely, that is very important. And for safety benefits, I prefer taking the sledgehammer and standing up and kicking it back to the back and doing it like that, okay. in the same way with the front, instead of doing this because there's a safety issue here. Number one, the instability. It's coming down, yep. you can crack your skull open, okay. but you can break that bone pretty easy. I don't know, it might be a good motivator not to drop it. it yeah, that's right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, and another thing, I got a sledgehammer, several of them, and you can take a tape measure, run it down the length of that handle, and do like one inch, take a marker, but one inch increments. 
And there's your progression without ever changing slave yeah. numbers. Just move up and down the implement to increase or decrease the leverage. Okay, so now let's go a little bit off the subject of grip. Okay, okay there's no, there's, I mean, besides trap, there's no other muscle group that irradiates power like big, massive, developed forms. Let's talk about, okay, so now I'm saying I don't really care about my grip strength, you know, to, to that degree. I just want some big billy clubs. What's the advice you got for people? Okay, and I'm glad you brought that up. Several years well, ago. We're not going to, we're definitely bringing this up. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. People, Good. People, they want to hear this. Did. Yes. Yeah. Uh, several years ago, I, was, I set out a, a personal goal of mine. No strength at all, no strength increase. I wanted to just get 14 inch forms. Okay. I set out to do that. And I. Starting from? I started at, they was like 13 and a quarter. And where was the time frame we're looking at? Uh, I did it in under six months. Okay. And here's what I did. To get it, setting strength aside and just looking at hypertrophy where you're getting the muscle bigger, what I did is I picked out a flexion movement where you're doing like a wrist curl. I picked out an extension movement where you extend your wrist. And then, and this is my favorite, and it just, you got to try this. You have to try this if you're in search for big forms. And I know you know who I'm thinking talk about, but there's an old time strong man, his name was George Zotman. And he come up with the Zotman curl. Well, let me tell you, if you take a dumbbell, let's use this loading pin as a dumbbell. Just imagine this is a dumbbell. And you, whether you're, you stand up, you have one in each hand, and you bring that up to here, and then you turn your wrist. Yep. And now the palm's facing away, and then you go back down. Okay, you've just hit the bicep, the flexors in the forearm, and when you turn it this way and go back down, now you've hit the brachioradialis, your extensors. It just covers both front and back of the forearm. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. Imagine that, that exercise, just that one movement, with a dumbbell that has a fat grips on it. That takes it to a whole nother level. And let me tell you, it will blow your forearms up so big, so tight, that you can't, I, I got to where I couldn't pinch the skin on my forearms with a pair yeah. of pliers. I'm glad you're saying this because a lot of people watch this actually train with me, so they can see that I put that, that's one of my favorite exercises, put the Zotman curls, the fat grips, and eventually progress it to like a five second really? negative on that. Oh, wow. So the thing is, we taught, the last, we one of the previous videos we did was on weight releasers. You, you see that one? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So the same concept here, it's just a similar, con not same, similar. So what it's obviously you're gonna be able to do more, you can't do as much on a reverse curl as you can a regular curl. So what you do is you're curling up like Joe's saying, however, you turn to get the negative, the eccentric is the reverse curl because you're stronger that way. So you're kind of overloading both. You're overloading just a straight up regular curl concentrically, then you're overloading the hell out of it on the eccentric, exacerbated by the fat grips then you get out of five second negative <laughs> and you guys will be screaming. So. And you'll be screaming <laughs> and it hits the entire forearm. You can get, I'm glad really, to hear you endorse that. Right? Absolutely. You yeah. can get like Billy club forearms from yeah. that, just doing that. And again, it's because you can't use much weight, but you can emphasize the eccentric, but it's friendly on the joints. Very. But let me tell you, it's not friendly on your muscles because it will blow them to oblivion. And now, now, and you look like a machine pump and pose junkie that never hit the pig iron. You've got small, <laughs> fall, small forearms. Yeah. That's just not, it's not socially acceptable in any strength circle. You must have decent sized forearms. Right. And, you know, when your forearms increase in size, just like any other muscle, there is the potential for more force output. But, but here's something I always tell people that I recommend the Zotman curls is they're trying to get bigger forearms but yet they, they want their grip stronger too. Well, here's how you solve that. You do what we just talked about with the Zotman curls. It's gonna to wanna to rip out of your hand on the way down. Yep, it's gonna to wanna to fly out. Well, if you set up in such a way at the beginning of your session, or you're doing forearms at the end, it makes no difference. Have some farmer's implements standing by and pretty heavy and do timed holds supersetted with them Zotman curls. And then get back with me and tell me how you feel. There's the strength component. If you want to get big forms and a strong grip, try that. And then try it with the oblique grip, like with, with towels or rags, that's something real strong, or even these pipes that's made for this. 
or you could use an anvil horn trainer. Whatever it takes, even you could use your V bars, just steel bars with plates on, just hold them. But you want up there pretty heavy, like 80, 85% range of your one rep max. And let me tell you, there's your strength and your size. But to specifically answer the question, I found nothing better than Zotman. Cool. So um, on the grip for uh, deadlifting, so you said what's some stuff for just powerlifters for deadlifting? Okay, first thing I'll touch on is the carryover from like the normal bar that you'd use for deadlifting. I, I would strongly suggest, and I've actually helped clients increase their deadlift this way, specifically their deadlift strength, where they don't lose the bar. One grip gives, or sometimes they just drop the bar. Their grip strength was a limiting factor. So one thing I strongly suggest to deadlifters is alternate like weeks or every other week, even once a month, but you do some axle deadlifts. It transfers very good back to normal size bar. So normal size, okay, cool. It transfers very well. The increase you get on the axle will translate back to a smaller diameter. I mean, significantly. Anything else? Oh, I would say the biggest, if, if someone said, give me your best tip, your best advice for deadlifts, deadlifters, and it's not specifically related to increasing their grip strength, mm -hmm. but it's very specifically related to being able to even train the deadlift, and that is skin tears. And skin tears, what happens is, when you deadlift over time, you develop calluses. This is a negative adaptation of your body. You keep doing it, the calluses get bigger and bigger and bigger. There's where you get the tears. These calluses, if they're left unmaintenanced and you just ignore them and they stick out like little frying pans, that gives that knurling on that bar something to grab a hold of and just, it, I've seen them, it's horrendous, just rip the skin, plumb off their palm. So. The most valuable thing for a deadlifter, so they can continue training, is to maintenance their calluses. And let me tell you the best way I've found from experience in helping an elite level powerlifter prevent this problem. What you do is you buy what they call a pumice stone. You can get them on Amazon. And then you buy, a, uh, there's several ways to do this, but you buy, it's called working hands. It's a hand cream. And what it is, it's for dry skin. And it hydrates your skin too. That, that's important. But what you have to do, you wet your hands like warm water and it softens up these calluses. Then you take that pumice stone and you, you grind them down, you, you file them down. Now, you don't wanna get rid of all the callus. You're maintenancing the calluses. You have to have a certain amount of callus to lift that heavy of weights. So it's protecting your hand actually, but if they stick out too far, it's gonna give that knurling something to grab onto and it's, you're gonna have a skin tear. So if you maintenance your calluses, and when you try this routine I'm suggesting, you'll, you'll figure out where that, that line is where it's too much or not enough. And you just, you, you file them down you put that uh, working hands on it, and as you deadlift, let, let's say you go another month, uh-oh, they're starting to come up again. Just take them down a little bit more, but, but I can't so emphasize enough. So it's on an as-need basis. As-need basis. But I can't emphasize enough, don't take them all off. That, that's, you have to build, you have to toughen, thicken your skin and build in calluses, especially when you're talking about elite level deadlifters. There has to be a, a certain amount of callus there, but when they're too big, I'm telling you, you're asking for it. It'll rip the skin. I imagine Josh has seen this time. I've used time. a stone a lot, but not the lotion, so that's interesting. Right, it helps. I've never had one of those tears either. Right, and, and some people, they're thinking, well, if I use the lotion or the cream, it's going to soften my hands. Well, it is going to soften your hands, but it's not like you do it. Well, I'm fixing the deadlift. Let me put this cream on. That's not what I'm talking about. It's maintenance post deadlift. Well, it's not going to totally soften it. It might be a little. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, and if you get working hands, it's in a green tub with a screw on lid. It's about that thick. It's the best stuff I've ever seen, and it, it has no petroleum base to it. 
it's all water based and it hydrates it heals up the dry skin because dry skin you know as you know it'll tear easier than hydrated skin so that's a that's probably the best advice i can give to a deadlifter cool. as far as being able to continue their grip training and increasing their grip strength with deadlift so um We've talked a lot on here before about compensatory acceleration training and isometrics. So it sounds like you've used some of that in our previous conversations. Yes. So how'd that relate to grip? Okay, here's what I did. It, this is my thinking. First of all, I believe strongly in giving credit where credit's due. Fred Hatfield came out with the CAT, the compensatory acceleration training. Josh learned it from Fred. And I'm indebted to Josh and Fred both for introducing me to CAT training. And here, here's the thing. There, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, I don't know what you call it. There's a saying in cap, you can't lift a heavy weight slowly. Okay. Well, I got to think of, okay. If you take a hard hand gripper or even a easy hand gripper and you try to squeeze it very slowly, it becomes 10 times harder. So I thought, well, why couldn't I take cat training and use it on grippers or any other aspect of grip? And, and here's the thing, with cat training, what you're doing, you're compensating by accelerating the weight. Or in the case of grippers, you're compensating by forcefully closing them handles. It's, yeah. it, you're accelerating the handles together. Well, on the weights, it, it, the only difference is you're accelerating the weight. You're using submaximal weights or a submaximal tension gripper, and you're accelerating the close or the lift. That that's, I mean, it's pretty simple, but the gains you get from it are huge. Yeah. And that's what I did. I did about six months worth of testing with cat training. I did it on grippers specifically. I used my youngest son Cody as a test subject, and without ever maxing out testing his one rep max, except every six weeks mm -hmm. he jumped like eight pounds on a rg a rated gripper in like two months and that's huge if you ask anybody that's big in grippers that's huge okay. and all i was doing was taking a gripper that was like anywhere from 55 85 percent of his one rep close that maxed out and have him accelerate that that close just with all the force he can and I did it with some axle training, same thing. You use submaximal weights, but you accelerate the weight. And that increases force production. And uh, what I did is, like I said, on whichever I did, the, the grippers, the axle, it made no difference. I didn't test, but once every six weeks. So it kept the weights, you know, relative, not light, but you know, I wasn't maxing out all the time because you, you really can't get, you're just spinning your wheels maxing out all the time. But CAT is the answer to that. Now, here's where isometrics comes in from my experience. I'm a big fan of isometrics. And as it's been proven over and over and over, you have about 15% more force output in an isometric contraction than you do a dynamic one. Well, that, that's big is if you're a strength athlete because what that means is is you can specifically on sticking points like i've been to one of josh's where he talks about cat in the bench press i bought his book best book i've ever read on bench press science and that's how i learned most of my knowledge about cat isometrics is, is you get 15 percent more force production and your sticking points so where you're normally weakest all of a sudden you got 15 percent more force in that position Furthermore, you can maintain that for five, six seconds or so, so you're doing a hell of a lot longer than you normally That's would. Right. Because if you did it like dynamically, you're gonna get that spot, you know, your max force production for, you know, a tenth of a second or so. Right, and and that's, I apologize for going blank there, but on the isometrics, Josh brought up a very important point. And like in his book and in his seminars, he, he uses it for sticking points. And that's huge because the 15% increase or the more that you can uh, put out, force output isometrically, that is huge for if, if, if you're, let's, let, let's take your gripper specifically. Let's say your sticking point is right there at parallel and you can't move it any further. Okay, this is where isometrics come in. 
you could take a block that'll fit in between these handles and isometrically squeeze that gripper, not 100%, I'm talking everything you've got, six to eight seconds, and then rest. But that's how you get past sticking points with isometrics. Well, do you do that with a cat, a cat set too? Yes. So yes. the thing is with the, that's gonna make your subsequent contraction with the cat set on anything more more powerful because it's you basically you're act like um, you're activating your higher thrust mo motor units yes, for right. doing that. It has so a pap boom, effect. Pap effect. So, yes. So that's that's kind of what's going. Yes, because if you're sitting here and you're maxed out on an isometric squeeze on a gripper, and it's at your sticking point, and then you the six seconds is gone, eight seconds, whichever you're using, and then you go to uh, another gripper that's. Uh, like let's say 70% of your one rep close, it will actually feel pretty easy versus if you didn't do the isometric first because of that PAP effect. And it really does work, it works great. And you're not always maxing out on grippers. I know guys, when they train grippers, they see if what they can get every single training session, well, what can I get today? But yet they, they never get very far because you're just spinning your wheels. You can't continually just literally max out all the time. It's go, your nervous system's gonna suffer. It's go, I mean, you just can't do it. You're gonna hit a wall. And that's where CAT is huge. CAT is, CAT's the number one important, it's probably the cat, most important training principle yeah. for a strength athlete. It's the difference also I've observed between strong people and not so strong people very strong people like inherently get cat whether they know it or not they may not have been told it it's like almost like it's it comes it comes to them naturally or something but they get you want to put maximum force into what you're doing for the full range of motion that's it that's it i'm so, a big believer in cat and I, i've always been a big fan of isometric so yeah so we're both actually um isa certified so that's kind of like where we you know initially i i got certified by isa when i was like 19 years old, and that's one of the first things I remember was at a seminar learning about cats. So yeah. it's, it's huge. But yeah. anyways, so tell us about how this grip training can supplement like regular training, how often it should be done, and and um, what kind of time commitment. Then you know, what if you want to take it a step further and go to competition? What do we? Well, like I said previously about uh, if you want to incorporate grip training like into your normal training, there's not a big time commitment if you program it right mm -hmm. because like I said, just working, if you just work the oblique grip in your session by adding just a few things, the time commitment is not much at all. And okay. usually, somebody that's not going to compete in grip, they're not going to do a grip contest, they're just wanting to enhance their grip along with their regular training. Okay, you're looking at 15 minutes at the end of a workout, depending on as long as they're not doing deadlifts. Yeah. I mean and just do some of the things I mentioned. And, the, and how often? Well, if you're a beginner at grip, a couple of times a week is sufficient. And, and like I said, if you do it right, and it's specific to what you're trying to, mm -hmm. let's say it's your pinch you're wanting to increase. You know, you're going to have to do more pinch specific stuff. If it's just your grip, like we was talking about, if you encounter somebody on the street or, you know, just, a functional grip that could save your life or has to do with your job function. I mean, just focus bouncer. on- Bouncer. Yeah, a bouncer. You gotta That's grab right. people, throw them out. So you That's gotta it. work. You That's it. end up in Juarez and you're working as a bouncer or something. <laughs> you got that. Yeah. So, but the, there's not much time commitment. And like I said, in any commercial gym, they got smooth weight plates where you can put the smooth sides out. They got hex dumbbells. Carry a, a gym towel with you, carry hand towels with you, wrap them around dumbbell handles. It's so easy to incorporate grip into your normal training. So then, um, kind of finished off here, what do you, so um, do, um, do you offer any kind of like coaching services or anything like that? Sure. If people want to talk to you, because what we can do is um, in the bottom under the video, we'll, we'll put in the description box, we'll put uh, Joe's email. So if you want to contact him, then you can also ask questions at the bottom of the video. Just and I'll make sure to let Joe know so he can respond sure. to the questions. And, and as always, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. That's all we ask. We're not yep. asking for money or anything. Just nope. do that. Yep.
So how can people? Okay, here besides here's the, thing. the emailing at the bottom. Okay, here's the thing, and let me answer the part I didn't on your previous question. I'll go directly into what you're asking. Okay, is if someone wanted to get into grip competition, here's the thing: you need to go to a contest. It doesn't matter. Leave your ego at home. You're going to have to go to a contest to experience, actually experience, mm -hmm. what it's like. Don't matter how strong you are at it, everybody starts somewhere. Sure. It's the way it is. Nobody at the grip competition is going to laugh at you. They've been there too. It's, they're good guys. The grip community is great, great people. And they're Grip's, helpful people. It's been suppressed, the grip community for a long time. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but go to a contest. Grip rights right here. Yeah. <laughs> go, go to a contest, no matter how big or small. Yeah. Try it out, see what you like, and see what you have a knack for. You might be strong at something naturally. You might be, you know, very good at grippers. You might be good at hubbing where you lift weights. Like or, Al Davis, remember that? When he'd never yeah. done this stuff, walked over. And walked over and just went straight up with a blob 50. He hugged the 45 pound plate, uh, the he, uh, 200 pound two inch handle dumbbell, stood right up with it. And this guy's a professional power lifter. Bench press specialist, and he did deadlifts. Bench press, yeah. And just had an enormous grip and it just so happens after he did all that, I took, I had brought a hand grip dyno with me and I said, hey, Al, I want to test your grip. He goes, what's that? And anyway, he said, okay. And he looked around and said, man, I hope Josh don't see me. He'll kill me for doing this. I said, no, give it a try. And just to give you an example, on one of these grip dynos, average hand strength between, for a 20 to a 30-year-old male is like 120 pounds. Al squeezed first time. I didn't coach him in any way. Just grabbed it, squeezed it. He did 242 pounds. Dang. That is off the charts. I mean, and the guy does no grip-specific training. And it just blew my mind. So go to a contest if you want to compete. Figure out what you like. Prepare for the next contest. And specifically train for the events. Well, you do some have. sort of grip challenges, right? They're not contests? Yes, and I'm glad you brought that up. I want to make this clear because a lot of people have been confused about what I've been doing lately. We may actually try to run one here at some point or something. I think it would be That would badass. be incredible. Yes, yeah. that would be awesome. Here's the thing. My goal, being I don't compete no more, is I like to run what they what I call grip challenges. And what it is, I set up four or five grip feats at a level that if you complete any of these feats, you can safely say, guarantee it, that you have a very strong grip. I don't put world record weights on them, on the implements, but I put them up there to where it's close to elite level. So, Grip challenges bring more new people to grip because the, there's no fear of competing. It, the curiosity kills them, and they just got to try it. Well, I just I can't leave not knowing if I can lift that revolving handle with the weight like this right here. I, I just got to try it. Or I can't stand knowing if I can't hub that 45-pound plate. So they try it. And I have introduced so many new people to grip that way versus a contest it's totally different. It's a different atmosphere, a different dynamic. Here's why. You have trained grip athletes that have been training for this these contests. Yeah. Okay? Rarely will you get, an, I'm not saying you won't get newcomers. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm in no way knocking grip contests. I love grip contests. They have their purpose. And it's a testing purpose. See where you're at compared to everybody else in your weight class. It's that simple. But a grip challenge is what I'm promoting and doing now to introduce new people to grip and showing and demonstrating the importance of acquiring grip strength. Whether you're a competitor, uh, a lay person, makes no difference. I think that's important. So that that's the difference. That's what I'm doing. What's I would love to hold one here. Yeah, what's so what's the what's the record on the Thomas and Dumbbell? Well, the Thomas Inch, they're making replicas. Yeah, I mean like a replica, loaded replica. It's yeah. a replica. And a Thomas Inch replica, they all weigh about the same, give or take a few pounds, 172. But now what people's doing, and it, it's really not accurate to compare like what you can do on a revolving handle of the same diameter as the inch versus an actual inch dumbbell replica. There's a few dynamics involved in this that there's yeah. not with the the actual dumbbell 
But 172 on a two and three eighths inch handle is, that's a considered an elite lift. You have elite grip strength, but there's a hand size factor there. The, long, sure. the larger your hand is, you have an advantage, but that's not to take away from people that have big hands. The hard training they do, the dedication they do in order to lift it. So I'm not taking nothing away well, from Well, it's people. sort of just a genetic advantage. Like it's a genetic advantage. In the NBA, if you're seven foot, you're more likely, it doesn't mean you're lazy to get there. It's just That's you're right. doing what you're set up to do. That's right. But if you, like, if you want to equalize out and take the hand size factor out of it, you can do several things. You can have like a V-bar lift where you're, that oblique grip. Uh, on a one inch bar, that way hand size factors out. And as of recently, uh, there was a man named Chris Rice, he's an older man, he come up with a device, it was a, it was a piece of pipe, and on the piece of pipe he had a, a thin plate welded all the way across, and he had a hole where you could attach, you know, yeah. your carabiner weight plate. And what happens, it was two inches in diameter, you put your hand around it like this, well, that plate prevents you from wrapping your hand around the bar. He called it a tips tester. To me, that is a true test of grip strength. With the, there's no hand size advantage, period. Because you can't wrap your fingers, and essentially if it's loaded, it's, you're doing this. Yeah. Your fingers are eventually gonna break loose. That's a good one. Uh, the V-bar lifts, uh, plate pinching. Again, there's no advantage to bigger hands. It, now there is a lot of technique in Euro pinch, a lot, and it makes a huge difference. But we're talking challenges here. We're not talking. Do they, the grip contests don't differentiate hand size, do they? No. Because no. that's funny, is like the same thing with strongman. It's like in strongman, if you're in a squat event, if you're taller, they measure it out so you have to go to parallel versus shorter. So, but, the, and they, but then for like stones or something, they don't lower them down for short people. So it's. Kind wow, like, that seems... It's kind of like tall people always get the advantage. Right, that's right. It's wow. sort of like that here, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's no hand size. They don't differentiate between that. It's weight classes. Yeah. And so uh, it's it's all, you know, like I said, it's a genetic advantage if your hands are bigger. But one thing I want to touch on before we leave is I highly recommend some type of grip dynamometer. Where do you uh, get that at? Okay, this one here is from Lafayette. And it's made in the U.S. All you gotta do is go on Google, type in Lafayette Industries. Uh, what are they? A workout co no. equipment company? A, a medical supply? Or? Medical supply. Medical yeah. supply. And here, here's the thing. And this is important. I use these not to train with, so to speak. I use these to test to see where I'm at. Ever so often, I'll test. Okay. They only measure your crushing strength, but that's important. I'll tell you why. Currently, recently, they've done some uh, testing with what they call biomarkers. Yeah. And your grip strength is a biomarker of the condition of your nervous system. Yeah, well, it's a good way to see if you're overtrained or not. That's right. So let's say you consistently squeeze 150 pounds and you test your grip before you train. 150, 150, 150. And then all of a sudden, let's say you did a lot of, you overdid your deadlifts or squats one week. You go to test again prior to your training, and it's 120. That's a biomarker. Grip strength is a great biomarker of the condition, the status of your nervous system. It's been proven over and over and over. So that's no one No fancy tests, no nothing. Nothing, just squeeze. But here's the thing. There's two different types. Actually, there's, there's, there's a static. This one's hydraulic. Nothing moves. Only thing that moves is that needle and then you reset it, okay? Your numbers will be higher on this one because of the isometric, You're, you'll have 15% more, but nothing moves. So that's a static test of your grip. You can move this handle in and out based on your hand length, yeah. but norm, normal testing procedures, even in a clinical setting, is this is on the second deal, the second position for, for anybody, unless you got a nine and a half inch hand. Okay, this one's static. This one, and this is one of my favorites, it, it measures your grip strength, but it's, it's a dynamic. Notice the handle actually moves. Where this one, it doesn't move. If you're just moving hydraulic fluid to press against that diaphragm, it moves the needle. This one is a spring in there. It's a calibrated spring. And when you squeeze it, see the handle? Your hand moves. 
It's, it's a dynamic test. And what I do is I'll use, I'll use this as a biomarker for the condition of my nervous system prior to training, and I've documented it for years. It works great. But also, if you become a GRIP competitor, it's good to use that as baseline testing. Yeah. Like, document, date, every time you, you test. Write it down, right and left hand. And, and a good way to do it so you can account for different factors is give three attempts, both right and left hand, with a one minute rest interval in between the attempts. And jot them down and average them out. And then over a year's time, you got a very accurate representation of not only how much your grip strength has increased, but you'll be able to pinpoint how, how you're going to perform nervous system wise in your training. I've done it, it works. So I wanted to I wanted to go over that. That's why I brought it. So that's I highly recommend it. And I guess so then kind of finish off so anybody wants to get in touch with you, sure. Just put we'll put your email down yep. at the bottom and my email is joemusselwhite2 at gmail.com. Also, if you type in Joe Musselwhite on YouTube, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, where I'm known the most is probably on Facebook, where uh, I keep constant updated pictures of my grip implements, how the collection's growing. Sometimes I'll do just short articles about stuff, but you can hit me up on Facebook. Main thing is my email, because that's where I, like if I get a new client and I'm doing online programming for them for their grip strength, I do it by email, not by the personal messenger through Facebook. That, that sucks, that, yeah. that don't work. It's not a good way to keep up with anything. And I prefer, if they're in the area, I love one-on-one -on -one training, because there's a big difference when you're trying to teach someone online versus live. And that's why I'm going to start having more grip training seminars is to show people and let them experience themselves. You know, get a feel for it. See what it feels like. See where you're good. See where you're weak. Main thing, see where you're weak. You know what to strengthen. But there's a lot of technique involved in a lot of this grip, especially if you're going to compete. But there's, there's a lot to getting your grip stronger. None of it is hard, it's simple, but it's not easy. And what I mean by that, there's a difference, simple and easy. Simple means the procedure is nothing to it. But they, the not so easy part is the consistency, the, the drive, the motivation, the determination to increase your grip strength. Yeah. That's how it works. So that, that's what I have to offer. I'd love to hear from people. If you have any questions, like I said, the questions, you can hit me up on Facebook, but if you're interested in programming specifically for grip, or you want me to have a seminar at your gym or your place, hit me up at my email and they'll put it at the bottom of the video. Cool. And I greatly appreciate y'all having me do this. Thank you. Total honor. Total honor. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Cool.